Hey, welcome everybody. This is Pastor Culture Talk. This is episode 117. I'm your host, Mike Badger. We're going to jump right in today and talk a little bit about highly pathogenic avian influenza. I have an interview coming up with Dr. Chrislyn Wood. She's a poultry scientist, a veterinarian located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. She specializes in HPAI and is really kind of at the forefront of some of this monitoring and, and of course, the disease response. I'm recording here in mid February of 2022. So about last week, I was at the PASA conference and I got an opportunity to talk with uh, Dr. Wood regarding HPAI. And so we, we set up, we recorded that conversation. I want to give a big shout out to Hannah Smith Boobreaker, uh, the executive director of PASA for making that happen uh, on such short notice. We, we thought an interview format would be fun and informative and kind of cover more ground than what maybe a, a stock presentation would be. So we weren't on the agenda necessarily, <laughs> uh, so, but we did have a few people uh, stumble into our rooms. They found us on the event app and, and listened in live while I, while I interviewed Dr. Wood. I think you'll find this a really far reaching and impactful interview. Dr. Wood is obviously talking about biosecurity. She has the, the, the conventional perspective here on HPAI. I bring in the pasture perspective and we have a really good conversation, I think. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Wood for joining me. You'll notice on the recording that you hear as soon as I click over and, and stop this introduction, we were on our third recording setup. I had just some problems getting the recording to work the way that I wanted it to. And so the volume fluctuates a little bit. And the other problem is uh, you get some room noise in there. Uh, you'll just notice it is this not a studio recording or even a, 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 a recording from my office. It is live in the environment, as they say. Uh, but that's that's where we are here. I'm, I'm a fan of the live environment. Without further ado, let's jump into the interview with Dr. Wood. Thanks for listening, y'all. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Chrislyn Wood. Uh, she's a veterinarian with USDA APHIS. And uh, I'd like to just ask you, Dr. Wood, take a few moments and just kind of introduce what it is you do, who you do it for, and, and you know, what poultry experience you have. Thank you so much, Mike, and thank you everybody um, with PASA for the invitation. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be here and speak with you, especially um, short notice <laughs> and um, about such a t very timely, important topic, avian influenza. But I'm a poultry veterinarian or poultry specialist with USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. I'm based here right in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been working with USDA for 18 years um, as a poultry specialist. So I mostly focus on avian influenza surveillance, and I work with states um, in the Northeast U.S. on their um, poultry surveillance testing for avian influenza. The main reason why um, you know, I'm here today is to mostly speak about highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, this is a very... Um, important and serious disease that is actually right here, right now um, in the United States. This disease, highly pathogenic avian influenza, it um, is very devastating to the poultry industry. Um, it kills birds very quickly and is very, very contagious. So once um, a group of birds get it, um, like domestic birds, like chickens, turkeys, those types of birds that you would have on your farm, usually the virus is pretty quick and it can kill them uh, within a couple of days, um, 90 to 100 percent mortality. So it is very, very serious. So, so I want to start with maybe the most obvious and pressing thing that most of our audience or listeners would probably need, want to know is how do I recognize if I have it? Um, so the clinical signs of avian influenza to look for are birds that are just dying higher than normal, and it's not associated with something that you might be aware of, like extreme weather or um, predators or um, some kind of toxin in the feed. You know, your birds are dying at a much higher rate than normal. That's the first and most obvious sign of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, some other signs that you might notice are if your birds um, don't eat and drink as much, that's a good sign. If you're able to, you know, you, you know how much food you put into the feed bins or how much water, and you notice a, a 
sharp drop in the feed and water consumption, that's one um, good sign. Also, sometimes the birds um, get very quiet. Um, and actually, in our Indiana case that was just diagnosed this week in commercial turkeys in Indiana, that is what they noticed, a drop in water consumption, and the turkeys were very, very quiet um, in the barn. So the birds might be kind of quiet and depressed and lethargic. And then sometimes you might see respiratory signs. So birds that are having difficulty breathing, you can hear uh, respiratory signs, coughing, sneezing, um, or snicking noises. Um, and then sometimes you might see um, discharge from the eyes and the beak. You can see discharge. Other things you might see are neurological signs where the birds have um, difficulty walking or twisted neck because the virus sometimes presents itself in a neurological form as well. Also for egg layers, you might see a drop in egg production. So, you know, you know what your normal levels are and there might be a sharp drop in egg, egg production. So those are all some of the signs to look for. Also the uh, combs and wattles might become swollen or um, like a bluish or purple color because the birds aren't getting enough oxygen like they normally would. Um, so the birds um, get this uh, swollen and bluish color combs and wattles and swelling around the eyes um, are some other signs that you might see. And some that if you have chickens or poultry, you know, some of those things present to shake other, other diseases. So it's important to kind of take it all in, right? You have to be observant with your flock. How do you confirm that you have Hypath AI? So if you notice any of those signs that just don't seem right, you can't attribute it to, um, you know, like I mentioned, like things that you're already aware of, like in the environment, the weather, predators, and things like that. Um, what you can do, or what we would like you to do, is call immediately your local um, state veterinarian's office. Um, so if you're in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Um, also, you can contact the USDA. Our office has a hotline, and I'll give you the, the numbers to call for that, and um, we'll direct you to um, for someone to come out and collect samples. Also, um, there are animal diagnostic laboratories. So here in Pennsylvania, we actually have three uh, animal diagnostic laboratories, um, Penn State University, University of Penn, and Pennsylvania Veterinary Laboratory in Harrisburg. Um, so you can call your local animal health diagnostic lab. And then also um, some of the colleges and universities that have um, agriculture extension offices. So for example, Penn State University is for Pennsylvania, Cornell University would be for New York, Rutgers University would be in New Jersey. You can contact your cooperative extension agent and they can direct you. Basically what would probably happen would be someone would come out very quickly um, to swab your birds and take a swab sample and submit it to the laboratory. Uh, once the laboratory, they have a test, it's a PCR test or polymerase chain reaction test, that's a DNA test. So it's, um, that test can be run within four hours to get a, a quick result. And once that test is done, they can quickly find out, you know, if we're dealing with avian influenza or we're dealing with another poultry disease. Because as Mike mentioned, some of the clinical signs can be lots of other uh, poultry diseases, um, not necessarily avian influenza. But once uh, the laboratory, the local lab, um, finds a diagnosis, if it is detected um, or a non-negative for avian influenza, that samples will be forwarded to our USDA National Veterinary Services Laboratory in Iowa, and they would do a confirmation test so that it's clear, you know, yes, we're dealing with avian influenza, and this is the exact strain that we have. So it is a very serious thing, and you know, as, if you're confirmed, then essentially the farmer loses all control over that response. You know, it's now a federal and a state response, right? They'll come in and manage what happens next. It's important to know that um, you know, USDA, um, and I'll say the United States, we have the 
the most robust um, or strongest avian influenza surveillance in the world. So we do a lot of testing and surveillance for birds before they move from the farms. We ask that farmers or producers call um, if they're sick birds, and we test that way. Also, wild birds are tested um, on a routine basis for surveillance and sick bird calls for wild birds. Um, so there's lots of testing. Um, but uh, one incentive is that if your farm is diagnosed with highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, USDA can provide indemnity or payment for um, the disposal of your birds. Um, but it has to be diagnosed by a laboratory first, uh, by our National Veterinary Services Laboratory. Um, but you would be paid the value of your birds, and that would be assessed in a fair way. And then also the disposal costs would be covered and some of the cleaning and disinfection costs because we want to control the virus and get rid of it. We don't want it to spread and become a bigger problem. Yeah, and just so we're, we're clear, the disposal costs, and so we have, there's, there's two mortality events in this, in this disease, right? There's one where the actual virus is, has that rapid onset and kills your, your flock, and then the federal response, or the, the response to this is to actually depopulate everything. So the depopulation killed as many or more birds probably than the initial event, right? Yes. So that's why it's very important that as soon as you notice um, any issues with your birds, you call someone immediately, you know, the USDA, State Department of Agriculture, the laboratory, call as soon as possible so someone can come out quickly and take the swabs and diagnose the issue because the sooner, the better. First, it prevents the spread of the disease. Second, we USDA would reimburse the farmers for the birds that are remaining on the farm that are alive. Um, so the quicker you um, we diagnose it, the, the better for everyone. Usually this virus, for the most part, it affects 90 to 100 percent of the birds. Over about a week's time, all the birds will, will die. And we don't want the chance that it's going to spread and become worse. All the poultry on the farm would need to be depopulated. All poultry species, so chickens, ducks, turkeys, quail, guineas, all poultry species that are susceptible to the virus. But if you have like other ruminant animals, like sheep and goats or cattle, those animals, you know, there wouldn't be any follow-up with them. Yeah. And so speaking of the other poultry species, where's the, the risk been in, in previous outbreaks? What poultry species are most at risk on farm? Right. So the um, two species that have been most at risk in previous outbreaks have been chickens and turkeys. Um, so in the 2015 outbreak that mostly affected the Midwest and um, Iowa and Minnesota, um, it affected the large commercial farms. And so it really hit um, Iowa very hard, 43 million um, egg-laying chickens and pullet chickens were affected by the disease in 2015. And uh, about 4, 000, sorry, 4 million turkeys in uh, Minnesota were affected. What I just heard you say was layers and pullets. Yes. And turkeys. And turkeys. Meat birds, not so much. There was no confirmed um, outbreaks with meat birds. There were some uh, meat birds that were affected, okay. but not in a large number. Okay. This is a good segue then to talk about the impact of HPAI, right? The, I think the term is reportable disease, which the way to deal with it is depopulation. What's the impact of that on, you know, we know the farm, right? The farm, is, that's, there's an emotional impact, there's an economic impact, um, but what about the broader economy? What makes this such a priority right. for USDA? The disease itself is so devastating to the, the poultry. Um, it kills 90 to 100 percent of the birds, and it's very um, contagious and spreads very quickly. Again, it's important that we control it very quickly um, because not only does it, will it affect or the loss of the poultry affect the farmer, but it, it's a trickle-down effect. It'll affect the, uh, feed, the feed producers. It'll affect the 
poultry suppliers, the breeders that supply your farm, the processors, and then ultimately the consumer. So in 2015, the egg prices did rise and the cost of uh, turkey meat did rise because of the outbreak. You remind me of the of some of the, I guess, the gravity of, of that. Like you mentioned the price of eggs increasing. Uh, the turkey market was disrupted too a little bit, as I recall. Um, in in 2014-15, there was what, 200 and, was it 211, 220-ish commercial sites, which is a, seems like a really small number to have such a big impact on our on the price of eggs. And I remember at the time thinking, it's, I still reflect on it, it, it just, and the pandemic of COVID brought, it brings this out too, that it doesn't take much to disrupt it. And, it. and avian influenza of our past outbreaks certainly showed that. The response that we get when we have, you know, the, the monitoring of the ducks has been going on, it's only going, it's always going on, but the positives that they find and, and you know, that you can hear the fever pitch kind of amplifying. We found a duck today that has HPAI in it, right? And it's for this reason, right? It's, that's right. part of it. Right. Yeah, so high path AI in the 2014-2015 outbreak, um, we saw it kind of move globally. We saw it first um, in Asia and Europe, um, overseas, internationally, and there were several um, outbreaks of the disease there. And then we kind of saw it in um, migratory birds as it came down the Pacific coast. It was detected in wild birds in the Pacific uh, flyway. And then it started to be found in captive uh, wild birds um, out in the, in, the, in the West Coast. And then that's when it started affecting uh, the farms. And actually, I went out to Washington State in Oregon um, in December of 2014 when the outbreak first started. And the first couple of farms that were affected were backyard small farms, uh, people that just had a handful of birds, maybe up to 50 birds at the most. And those were the farms that were affected first um, in about December of 2014. And then later on in the spring, uh, about February, March, um, was when the outbreak spread to the commercial industry, to uh, Minnesota and Iowa. About April in the spring is when it really exploded. It had a bigger impact, but the backyard smaller flocks, you know, are not, Im not immune to the disease. And I like to frame that as we have chickens, right? We have layer of poultry. It's a poultry disease, so by that very nature, we have risk. We, we can't avoid the risk. Um, the, the question, I guess, really is how do you, a, a small pastured operation, deal with the risk? You know, we're, the backyard folks are a little bit different. So what kind of, here's a question for you. and I, I, it's, it's kind of a hard question in that the answer is not readily available, I don't think. I, I know the epidemiological surveys ask this question. How many of the flocks that were positive in our last outbreak were organic, like certified organic? or even pasture? That's a good question. I don't know exactly that answer, but I can try to look into it and get back to you. But I can tell you that uh, there were about 20 something uh, backyard producers that were affected. Yeah. And then there were about 200, um, a little over 200 um, commercial premises that were affected. Yeah. And I and actually have those numbers. The, um, the backyard, there was 21 backyard sites, 10,000 birds roughly. 211 commercial sites, 50 million birds. Um, and when you drill into the backyard numbers, two of them were game farms. So I think it counted for you know, 5,000 ish birds. And so you, you really start stripping away the numbers when you, when you go from that commercial environment to the, the backyard. As this whole thing's happening, you know, one thing I do object to, and I'll, 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 I'll say it, not that you can do anything about it, but knowing these numbers and watching them come out, and USA had this really cool day-by-day uh, -day tracker. So every time a site tested positive, you could see exactly where it was, you could see what kind of flock it was, and, and all that good stuff. And it was really cool. It helped you really kind of visualize the outbreak um, and put things in, in perspective. And 
but every time of, there would be an incident of, of discovery, like they found HBAI in a flock, you know, be like, hey, we found this flock of turkeys is positive. We're, we set up our quarantine, everything is the response. And, but then invariably, one of the lead press pieces of that would be, and backyard flocks are at risk because they don't have biosecurity, and the, the connotation is they're going to they're going to kill all the commercial flocks. That's how the marketing is coming out of the response, and it's it's industry wide, it's statewide, it's federal response wide, and you look at the numbers, you're like, it just doesn't bear out. What do you say about that? <laughs> you're asking a controversial question. I, it is a controversial <laughs> question. I understand that, um, but you know, this is the things that we think about. And I'm sure you know that our audience, you know, possum members and uh, pasture poultry producers in general, have checked out of the commercial, the, the mainstream way of thinking, especially when it comes to rearing poultry, and and believe that there's just some different ways and even better ways to do things. And, and these are the questions that come up. Sure. And and I know you don't put out those releases. That's the impression that this community feels when they read all that. They're like, well. As you mentioned earlier, um, just having the this, this species, having chickens, ducks, turkeys, you know, that puts you at risk in itself um, for, for getting the virus. And I can say the main way that the virus is transmitted is either through wild ducks and geese um, or other wild birds like gulls can spread it, um, shorebirds can spread it. And then those birds either come in contact with domestic poultry or their droppings or their feces come in contact with a person or equipment and that gets brought into a domestic poultry flock and that's how the flock gets the disease. Um, so I appreciate that um, the um, pasture poultry group, you know, I believe you guys care about your birds deeply um, and you work, I'll say, a little bit more closely with your birds than the commercial industry might, um, and you really care. So I believe that you practice good biosecurity, um, but we just want to give you tips to prevent um, disease spread, not just for avian influenza, but for lots of other diseases. Um, so for example, just things you can do to prevent um, wild birds from coming into co direct contact with your birds is extremely important right now because we found more than 91 uh, wild bird detections that have been confirmed just in the last week in the Atlantic Flyway Zone from Florida up to um, Maryland, Delmarva um, area has found uh, just 91 cases in wild birds in the past week that have been confirmed. So this virus is out there in wild birds definitely right now. So any, would, how does yeah. that compare to, I'm sorry, how does that compare to previous years, that surveillance? Right. So previous years we found, um, we have not found as much uh, in the wild birds in previous years. So it's hard to say if this year if the surveillance is better. Um, I think the numbers are about the same, okay. but um, we've just been picking up lots of virus um, in the past, you know, that have been confirmed in the past week. Can we correlate the uptick in surveillance to what we think might happen on the farms? Like we, we haven't had a lot of outbreaks here in the last couple of years, and right, right. I know surveillance happens all the time. Right. So um, we do lots of so USDA Wildlife Services and other wildlife groups they do a lot of surveillance. Um, for example, in the Atlantic Flyway Zone for the winter season, I believe there's about seven to eight thousand. Wild birds is the goal uh, for the season. Yet yeah, we've found nine, 91 detections of highly pathogenic avian influenza so far. So that's, that's a lot. We do find low pathogenic avian influenza periodically in the wild birds, but just the fact that we've found the highly pathogenic strain is very concerning. So the question was, are there other birds other than the shorebird affected, like sparrows and things like that? Right. So the small um, birds um, that you mentioned, like sparrows and things, um, they can definitely be carriers of the virus. Um, they're definitely susceptible. We haven't found the virus in those 
bird types in particular, but they are definitely carriers for the virus, and they can bring it into um, a domestic poultry flock. How do you recommend, how does USDA recommend that we intercept that right. from, the, from the ducks to our poultry? Yes, yes. So our USDA uh, group has lots of resources online. Um, the campaign is called Defend the Flocks or Biosecurity for the Birds, and there's lots of um, videos and uh, resources that you can um, check out. Actually, there's some flyers here you can take if you would like. Um, but basically, uh, for the smaller flocks, we recommend six um, steps to prevent the disease. One of the main things that I'll mention is with the wild bird introduction or the wild bird risk. So um, avoid contact with wild birds. Um, also, be careful about, you know, people, you don't know, you might step in wild bird, you know, uh, duck feces and accidentally bring it into your flock. So it's important that you do things like maybe set up a foot bath or dedicated shoes if you can um, before you go in with your birds, wash your hands, um, try to avoid being around other poultry places, especially during high risk periods. Um, just because you can transmit diseases and not and not know it. Um, but the different, I'll say the, the six steps for uh, the biosecurity steps are one, keep your distance. Don't let your birds have contact with wild birds or migratory birds because they can carry germs and disease. Number two is to keep it clean. So keep up with your cleaning and disinfection of your feeders and your waterers on a routine basis, any equipment that you use to transport the birds, the crates and the, and the vans and vehicles to move your birds. Um, number three is don't call disease home. Um, so starting off with buying birds from a reputable source, um, for example, the National Poultry Improvement Plan, um, the, the birds can be certified for avian influenza, um, mycoplasma and salmonella. Um, number four is don't borrow disease from your neighbors, so avoid sharing equipment without uh, cleaning and disinfecting it first. Um, but ideally, it's best to have your own set of equipment. Number five is know the warning signs, so know those clinical signs, um, the sudden death loss, um, the respiratory signs that can't be explained by normal things. Know what those signs are. And then number six is report sick birds. Um, so you can call um, your local um, state Department of Agriculture, Animal Health Diagnostic Labs, universities, um, and USDA. And I'll give the um, hotline for our USDA. It's 866-536-7593. So no matter what state you're in, it should route you to your local um, state's um, USDA Veterinary Services Office. And if you're here in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture hotline is 717-772-2852. So you can call either of those numbers and someone will respond quickly, you know, investigate and try to do sampling to help you figure out, you know, the problem with your birds and diagnose it quickly. Question is, what do you do from the time that you have an incident where you want to report it and when you wait for the response to get to your farm, how, what steps do you take? Right, right. So while you're waiting on results or waiting for someone to sample your birds, you want to keep everything as uh, isolated as possible. So keep your poultry contained in one area. Um, you want to clean and disinfect, you know, make sure uh, you're, you're clean, so if you go anywhere else that you're not spreading the virus, um, so any equipment, your shoes, um, your clothes, that you would not go to another poultry place and you know inadvertently spread whatever the, the disease is. So on, on biosecurity, you know, obviously one of the challenges a pastured flock has is birds are outside. Uh, this time of year, not so much. They're inside, they're confined. Um, they typically have a lot more floor space than what you would find commercially. But as spring, as we get into March here, 
layers will be start to go back out on the pasture um, where you know this where, where they're going to mingle with the environment right that's one of the, that's one of the challenges with, with pasture environments is we are exposed to the environment so based on what we what you've seen and what we've seen with the previous pandemic and studying it what are if you had to say you were missing some biosecurity options there but if you were to say okay these are the things that you should do. These are the top two, three things that your biosecurity plan should include. Mm -hmm. If you have, you understand your farm and how your farm is set up, and you notice, you know, if there's wild birds in the area, you know, or or not. Um, but anything you can do to um, reduce or avoid contact with wild birds is very important. Um, so there's lots of wildlife groups, for example, our USDA Wildlife Services group, you can call them and they will do an assessment and help you uh, reduce wild birds on your property. So for example, if you have like a pond or a stream on your property, they can um, assess it and maybe recommend some things like, for example, I've heard of people with, they put rocks, different types of rocks that are sharp so that the wild ducks and geese don't like to land in that area anymore and they find another place to go. Um, there might be um, like a decoy, a visual decoy that um, kind of scares the birds off somewhat to, to prevent them from coming near your property and near your birds. Um, but the Anything you can do to avoid the contact with the wild birds is, is very important. And then try to avoid you bringing anything into them. Would equipment be in that top things? Like, I think there was emphasis on the sharing of equipment, feed trucks going in and out of different places, um, haulers and crates and, and that kind of thing. Avoiding the wild birds is not really easy for pasture. I'm trying to set a priority of, of the things, you know, the, the, the Pareto principle, right? The 20% the of the things you can do to result in 80% of the effort. Right, right. However you want to spin that. Would you put an emphasis on sharing of equipment with other farms? Right, so, not to do that. yeah, that's good. So any equipment that you bring in to work with your birds, you know, make sure that it's, um, it's cleaned and disinfected. <laughs> Um, so if you're using it with your birds, you know, make like the feeders and the waters or let's say a rake or anything that uh, when it comes in, it's, it's cleaned and disinfected or dedicated to your farm and you clean and disinfect it on a routine basis. So if there is any disease that might be in your birds already, you know, it won't get worse. You just want to stop that cycle. So anything you bring in, make sure you clean and disinfect it periodically kind of a different way of looking at that question it was looking at the epidemiological survey of, I think the one I have is dated July 2015, so kind of in the middle of that summer of, of 2015. They mentioned some risk factors that could potentially decrease your risk of, uh, of infection. And you, do, you have, do you have any insight into what that would be? Like, like how, what, what factors could potentially be advantageous on a farm that would prevent infection or reduce the risk. Right. So um, there's lots of things, but um, trying to control the people that are coming on and off of your uh, properties, specifically the people who have contact with the birds and the feed. Um, so if you can um, keep track of um, your workers, um, any visitors. Ideally, you want to have your workers not work with any other poultry of their own or any other poultry outside of your farm, ideally, and that will help reduce your risk right there. Also, just having things available for anybody working with your birds, um, for example, dedicated boots that you have. And it can just be simple farm boots. It doesn't have to be anything fancy or anything. You can just have dedicated um, slides that can be, you know, cleaned and disinfected and, and washed um, with soap and, and water or disinfectant, uh, but those boots be dedicated to your farm and not go, you know, when you 
go to the store, go anywhere else to the feed store, because though you can bring disease back from anywhere else outside in. Um, so those are some additional things that you can do. The one thing that stuck out to me, and I, I, I'm not sure how this works, so I, I want to uh, legitimately ask your opinion, but it was 100 yards from the road. So like from a road or a gravel road was, was listed as, a, as an advantageous thing that lowered your risk. Right. And so can you talk about why that might be? Sure. So in some areas um, that might be very dense with poultry, for example, um, I believe that epidemiology report probably focused on um, Minnesota, where there so, yeah. were lots of um, the commercial turkey flocks, and um, a lot of the farms are very close together. So as poultry trucks were driving, you know, some of the feathers and debris comes off and can infect your farm that might be close to the road. So ideally is um, a lower risk for your farm to be some distance away from the road um, where there might be other poultry vehicles driving up and down. The reason I, I focused on that is because that is actually one place where a pastured farm typically is going to uh, be, a, be advantageous. But that's because a lot of times our poultry is off the road. It, it is going to be in a, in a pasture somewhere, so it is separated. And I see that as an advantageous uh, part of this conversation. One thing I just find fascinating, and we didn't talk about it here when we talked about what avian influenza was. You mentioned it, I think, that we have low path and we have an, a high path mm -hmm. version. What's the experience of, of the virus? Can a virus mutate, change? Or does it go through cycles? Does it, does it even change when it gets inside a barn? Like, what's How volatile is this thing? Right. There's lots of different strains of avian influenza. Um, I don't want to get too technical, yeah, but... We can say plain English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, there's lots of different strains or different types. So the two types that we worry the most about are called H5 and H7. Hemagglutinin 5 and hemagglutinin 7. That's the protein on the outside of the virus. So... Those two strains can start off as a low pathogenic strain in birds where the signs are not very severe, the birds may be mildly sick, um, and sometimes they don't show signs at all. Um, especially ducks and geese usually don't show signs of uh, avian influenza because they are the reservoir or the uh, carrier species. They usually don't show signs. But when the virus goes into different groups of birds, especially when it moves from waterfowl like ducks and geese to what we call gallinaceous birds like chickens, turkeys, quail, um, guineas, the virus tends to change more or mutate. And those are situations where a virus might move from a low pathogenic strain to a highly pathogenic strain where when it goes into this new group of birds, it can kill the birds quickly and become a highly pathogenic strain. So let's talk a little bit then about the environment. One of the questions I asked, I asked some folks in APA uh, to share some questions, you know, if people want to know how some of the stuff we already talked about. But one question was one about environment. Is it favor one environment over the other? Um, and then related to that, like, is distribution across climate and see the, the kind of even, like where's our risk back? Right? right, great question. So uh, avian influenza virus, it prefers cool and moist conditions. Um, so areas where it's cold and damp is where it survives best. Um, so typically the virus is seasonal. So when it's carried by the migratory birds, the times when we see most of the cases are in the fall carried into the winter and into the spring. That's mostly when we see the bulk of our cases. But the virus does not like hot and dry conditions because that kills the virus. So during the summertime, that's when we usually see our cases be at a very, very low level. So typically fall, um, winter, and spring during those moist and cool conditions are our highest concern. 
and, and specifically, it doesn't hold up well to sunlight, right? Like exactly. UV light. UV, UV light and sunlight will kill the virus. Again, that's why the summertime is the best time uh, where we don't see a lot of avian influenza. Gotcha. The, the advice always is, you know, lock your birds up, confine them, and in, in response to this, and then, you know, if you're a certified organic flock, you've already gotten notes from PCO that you can confine your flocks, right? You have to have doc, you have to do it in a certain way, but but it's okay to, to not have that outdoor access, for example. And I look at the numbers from from 2015, and I'm like, inside is one of the worst places you can be. Like that's there's no hope. Um, <laughs> Um, because if the virus gets inside, and this is here's my, my here's my question, um, or I'll get there. But uh, so the the commercial flocks who are, who are disproportionately affected, the ma the majority of the, the problems, right? The the outbreaks, the, the the illness is once it gets inside there, we have an intensely confined environment. That has no external environment, no sunlight coming in there. Typically, everything's—they're just—it's just there. It's like it's like a petri dish, and I think the the technical term that you would use is viral load, right? There's such an intense viral load in there that the birds, when I say no chance, when it gets in there, there's no chance in that environment. That's why biosecurity in that environment is so important, right? Um, and and the reason that I asked you about the the organic flocks, specifically certified organic and pastured is, can each one of those flocks have a different density of birds, either in the farm in general, but even in the housing environment? And and so this is a speculative question or an insight, but do you think that has more, something to do with the, the flock's ability to respond to a, the virus? Like it comes in contact, you know, I'm not saying, I think it would be I would think it would be disingenuous to say that a pastured bird, for example, never came in contact with HPAI. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true at all. But you know, I think it is reasonable to say that we haven't had um, dis a disease come through a flock that needed to be depopulated. So, so can you can you think about the wh where do you think that stocking density comes into play in this conversation? So when we think about viruses and bacteria, there's a, a triangle of disease, basically. And it starts with the host agent, the agent or the virus that's being introduced in the environment. So first, the host has to be as, um, you look at the immune status of the, the, the chicken, for example. Uh, first, it, it's a susceptible, is it a susceptible species to getting the virus? Um, and what is the health status of that animal? Um, do they have other diseases that might lower their immunity to fight off if it gets exposed to avian influenza or other viruses? Um, so the immunity of the host is one factor. The second uh, factor is the agent um, itself. So the virus, when it's introduced, does it, um, is it a lot of virus? Is it a huge viral load, or is it just a very tiny amount? Unfortunately, with highly pathogenic avian influenza, and we saw this right here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in 1983 and 84, just enough virus to cover uh, one gram of manure, um, just enough to cover the head of a dime, was enough to infect one million birds. Um, so it's that contagious, and, and so biosecurity is very, very important. But it depends on the amount of virus that the birds are introduced to, to you know how how susceptible they are. And then the last part of that triangle is the environment. So yes, um, the ventilation um, that they have is important. The temperature that the birds are kept at um, is important. You know, just like people, you're m less likely to get sick if you're like with COVID if you're in a well ventilated environment and you're spread apart from people or other birds, you yeah. know, a certain distance. Um, so those are things that help. So it's a combination of all those different things that make the birds more or less susceptible to disease. And I, I certainly appreciate that explanation. And I mean, I, I, I would 
I would agree. I think that's that's where most of our folks believe, and that's the way they manage their flocks. Is they 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 understand that there's that risk, and that there's layers to it. And so I, I appreciate breaking that down. This, this really hit home because I think this whole idea of viral load like, it first came into my lexicon when, during the outbreak in 2015, and somebody's like, you know, like all the back channels are saying that this is viral load in the barn, right? And I'm like nobody's saying that out loud. And then at some point, your your agency APHIS published an interim rule for indemnity payments because there was the dispute between the contract growers and the growers about who would get paid for the birds that were destroyed, right? So USDA had to say set some rules in place. But the the curious thing I thought about that I recognized in there was yet they they essentially said you had to have a biosecurity plan that was filed and you know auditable, I think. But there were some exemptions. And there were some exemptions based on flock size. And the reason there was exemptions based on the flock size was because of the risk factors that we've talked about. You know, just economic risk, the risk of spreading out of a small site, but even the the on smaller facilities, quoting, the bird density tends to be less, which minimizes overall viral load. And then when the final rule was published, you know, that goes out for comment, and the final rule was published, and and there's people obviously distraught that exempt there would be exemptions from this. Um, but USDA s stood firm in their reasoning and they expanded and addressed those questions, basically saying some of the things that I've talked about, you know, summarized, and, which I thought was really, it was, it was a side of the conversation I didn't hear publicly, but I appreciated it, that it was out there. And I appreciate that you've talked through it too. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you covered a lot right there, <laughs> but, um, Higher dense um, poultry farms, you know, if a virus gets in, it does have a higher impact, I'll say, um, because of the amount of birds, because of their connections with other, um, you know, farms and within their company, they share the same, you know, some of uh, employees or um, feed trucks, you know, it's a connected system. So disease has a easier chance to spread. Um, however, I just don't want the pasture poultry group to feel as though you're exempt or um, it can't affect you because it really can and really devastate your birds and your, your, um, your ultimate um, livelihood. And we want to protect you and you to be educated so you do things that are reasonable you know, to prevent the spread of the disease or the introduction of the disease. So anything you can do to, um, again, reduce contact with wild birds and their droppings, keep things clean, um, and know what the signs are. If you see the signs, call quickly so that we can diagnose it so it doesn't spread. Because some of you might have connections with other pasture poultry farms, and we don't want the disease to spread you know, further you know, among your group. So it's just important that everyone know um, you know, be educated. There's lots of resources on our USDA website, um, and all the uh, universities um, have lots of great information to Cooperative Extension Agency, and we can help walk you through things. And um, everything isn't avian influenza when we see uh, dead and dying birds. It can be lots of other diseases, but we would like to control it if it is avian influenza so it doesn't become a, a huge issue. In the Midwest in the 2015 outbreak, it was just very devastating. I personally worked with the backyard flocks um, out in, Minnes in um, Washington State in Oregon and saw their birds dying. And they had birds that were partially outside, and they kind of felt like, oh, they, they felt as though they were immune to it, but they were not. And their birds um, died in high numbers. And then... I also saw the other side when it affected the commercial industry and their birds, you know, died and the difficulty and the stoppage of work and their livelihood. So we just want mm -hmm. everyone to have inf the correct information and to know, you know, how you can proactively prevent disease. And then if you do have a sign, signs of it, just call and report it quickly so that we can um, help you figure out what the issues are. A lot of the animal diagnostic laboratories 
will test for avian influenza free of charge. So I don't want you to worry about that. There would be no cost to test for avian influenza. But if it's not avian influenza, the laboratories can also help you figure out what it what the problem is. So you're not just left empty handed, you know, your birds are sick and you don't know, they can definitely continue to work with you to help work up the case and figure out the problem. I appreciate the position that pasture poultry <laughs> groups are in. Um, and I understand your, you know, philosophy and I, I um, appreciate it. And it is a, a balancing act, um, but um, yeah, when your birds are inside, yeah, as Mike mentioned, you know, the ventilation is important. Keeping all the equipment as clean as possible is important. You know, making sure that when your workers come in and out, um, they do things like clean their boots or have dedicated shoes. As much as you can do within reason, you know, it's up to you to um, figure out what works for your farm, what's reasonable, um, and what you can do to proactively prevent. Right. Yep. So, um, typically, the virus is spread um, through direct contact with sick birds, right? Physical or indirect contact with the feces or feathers. But in cases where there is a high viral load um, and lots of birds. Um, with spreading virus, you know, just that air movement. If there's birds that are very close, um, or let's say a flock of uh, ducks and geese that are wild that have it, and they just go near your your farm, you know, the dander that can have the virus can land. So it it can be somewhat airborne in, in those particular cases where there is a high virus. Good question. We are at the end of our time. Thank you so much for yes. coming. Thank you, Dr. Wood, for, for answering questions and helping us keep our flock safe. Sure, thank you. Thank you.